Hey, what's happening, ladies and gentlemen? It's your friendly neighborhood black guy, Charles Curse III, and I'm here with Politics and Poetry presents the written experience powered by Camden One. I'm here with my brother of poetry, yeah. Ambition the Poet. I'm excited to have you today. Thanks. It's been a long time coming. Yes. Since the first time I met Ambition online, I was like, this, this is the hardest working <laughs> man in poetry. Thanks. He is the hardest working man in poetry. Ambition, just for a second, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Wow. Thank you for uh, having me on this platform. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Air Bishop the Poet. Um, I like to call myself the first foster care poet in the history of the United States. What that means is that there was other uh, poets who had been to foster care. Uh, but as far as the branding and my whole sole purpose is to make sure I inform the public about the foster kids that was like me. City, suburbs, and also on the countryside. Um, I'm just a kid that really came from North Philly, but was raised in South Jersey with a story to tell about how my foster care journey shaped who I am. And so now I'm just in the street telling that story, telling my pain, and telling people who I am. So, like, your experience as a foster child, when, when, when did you first go into foster care? So we're talking about at least two, um, all the way up until 14 when I finally uh, was adopted. Um, and so up until about the age of uh, 8 to 10, I uh, in Philly. And then um, my last foster mother was in uh, Sickleville, New Jersey. She really is from uh, what they call West Oak Lane in Philadelphia uh, and decided to adopt me. So, yeah. That's beautiful. So yeah. how, how uh, were you exposed to writing and poetry in general? Like being in a foster care yeah. system, you would think, you know, you have, don't have access to, and it sounds something simple, but mm -hmm. literally there's no one sitting you down talking mm -hmm. to you about poetry, no one's helping you learn how to write or express yourself. How did how how did you get exposed to that? Yeah, it's interesting is that I really didn't get exposed to poetry, I got exposed to hip hop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, my foster mother would always listen to uh, Biggie. <laughs> and when I first got exposed to hip hop, I knew that I loved it, but I didn't know really what it was at the time. I just was like loving the way the person would rap, the way Biggie, um, to this day mm -hmm. and so at that time when I first got into foster care all of my pain and all of my issues with some of the kids and some of the things they were saying I just was writing stories so I didn't really start off with uh, poetry I started off with writing stories and then I got into rapping in middle school and then <laughs> when I became an adult I got into uh, poetry yeah. right because that's that's exactly what happened to me I was rapping first right. when I was like in middle school <laughs> and I remember you know, I remember specifically, I'm, I'm rapping, uh, we do freestyle battles. Mm -hmm. And someone sat there and rapped Meek Mill word for word. And I'm like, oh, maybe I ain't good as I thought I was. <laughs> and I stopped writing all the way till I got to college. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that, you know, you talk about how uh, hip hop is what exposed you, you know, yeah. yeah, to writing poetry and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Cause you know, ultimately, hip -hop, it's the same, right? Yeah, ultimately it's, it's, it's the same. Yeah. So like, um, where where was the first place you ever performed it? Yeah, man, it was, that's Forty Eighth and Gerard. <laughs> Something called Breed Love. Okay. Um, and so didn't understand the poetry scene. I actually asked a friend, my best friend Sonya, like, "Yo, I want to do poetry." She's like, "All right, make a call." Made a call. She's like, "Yo, something that you know down on Forty Eighth and Gerard. It's gonna be called Breed Breed Love. Here's the address." Mm -hmm. First two times, I was so scared. I didn't perform. I just got just came there, and then. You know, after that, the rest Did of you write your name on the list or you just was No, like, I just came there. Because, <laughs> you know, at the beginning, like, you don't know what you're doing. Right. Like, I just, I always, in that time, came in, I observed the open mic come, hey, hey, my name is, and then, you know, give yourself a few times to observe and then see how you go forward from there. So what was, like, the biggest obstacle that you've had um, as a foster child? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like, how has writing helped you through that? Oh man, the, the bigger obstacle I think of uh, being a foster child was really explaining it. When I first came from Philly to Sickleville, I don't really think South Jersey, in a sense, had an understanding of what foster children was. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, in the suburbs, no one's just talking about <laughs> foster children anywhere. Even when I went to Volkey, I don't even think, when I was trying to tell all my friends that was from Camden at the time, I don't really think they understood. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you're from Philly, but you live here? How is that possible? Right. So, you know, the mindset and, and trying to explain my story and where I'm from and why my mom don't look like me, right? And why my brothers don't look like me. It was the constant explaining of 
my life every day and I couldn't because articulating foster care at that young right. age is hard and difficult. And so that was the hardest thing. Um, and what was the second question? I forget. You said something about poetry. Uh, yeah, I, I think I might ask like, where's the first where's the first place you performed this? Yeah, I told you, yeah, yeah, we love. Yeah. yeah. And then the writing, oh, the writing as it relates to foster care, I'm sorry. I knew that I had to talk about foster care when I got into the slam, <laughs> it tried to do the slam in West Side of Philly, and it wasn't good. What slam was it? I can't remember. Oh, you said it was so long ago. So the slam wasn't good. Your poem wasn't good. My poem wasn't good. I was trying to do some scientific stuff. <laughs> um, like, roses are red. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yo, it was trash, bro. I can't lie to you. And my nephew said. You know why you're not winning. You know why no one cares about your poetry. It's just in this small portion of my beginning, he's like, because you're not telling the truth. You're not, you're not telling them about the truth, about what you are. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, bro, I don't want to talk about that. You know what I mean? At first, I was, to that place again. It's going to take me to that place. Then questions are come. And I just don't know, you know? And so I did what he said. I went home. I went, um, this is Revenge of the Foster Kid. And then everything changed in the poetry community. It was gone from there. And I knew as it relates to writing, we cannot run away from our stories that make us who are, who we are. Without it, no one cares if you're just talking about stuff that's relevant to no one. They want to know your story and why you're in front of them and why they should listen. Not you trying to impress them with words. Not what you trying to impress them with these concepts. Do they feel what you're saying? When you're in Philly... Camden, these inner cities. If you go there and they don't feel you, you're gonna get. Yeah, it's gonna be. They gonna let you know. Let you let know. You like, like, and next, you know. Right. So, yeah. and that's what I'm gonna say. Also, don't don't uh you know get discouraged about slams and stuff like that either. Mm-hmm. Because like one thing also is like you also have to know like slams have personalities as well. So like you know sometimes that just might not be the venue for you because it's drawing a certain type of community or you know whatever the case may be. So maybe you might just have to take your your talents mm-hmm. elsewhere. You know what I'm saying? No, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, it's, and it's appreciated and all those places because I'm very I already know you're appreciated like all over the country at this point. <laughs> so it's like where what places have you been able to perform at? Have you had the opportunities to perform? Oh man, so many places uh, I did. So many stages. I did a few colleges, um, high schools. Um, it's funny because I performed over at Elite right here. Okay. Camp, yeah, we did uh, something there. Um, festivals, just did Juneteenth. I mean, states, though. Let's talk states. about the states. Oh, though. man. This man, he travels. Oh, yeah, I'll be yeah. sitting there like, damn. I like, mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> states. It look easy, bro. No, I mean, we, we, I did, I performed in California. We did a little something there. That was virtual, but I was actually there physically. We um we did all up and down the East Coast. I mean, pretty right for these years. I mean, really working on the East Coast. I tell people all the time, I strategically perform in a state that I think is appropriate to attack. And so you know, right now working on the East Coast, I'm so excited to finally get to go to Texas and do my thing out there. Um, but like you said, man, yeah, it's working and putting your brand out there, especially if those states have. Amazing poets, I gotta meet them. You know what I mean? Like I got to. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask, like, so like, as far as these states concerned, where's your favorite place to perform at, and what 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 vibe do you like the most? I guess on the poetry scene, what what offers the most uh, the poetry right. scene? Which state, what city? Or, you all know, right, first of all, give us the insight. Give us the breakdown, right. ambition. For me, <laughs> for me, I gotta say Jersey. I'm so sorry, North New Jersey's for me, mind blowing. I mean, they actually have a poetry commission related to the government with poetry. Like, I see that. That's how serious. You see what I'm saying? Like, they have a government body for poetry. Mm-hmm. Um, so, North is unbelievable. Um, I love what they do as it relates to the city. Like, they really take the poetry to the next level. Mm-hmm. I've never seen poetry embraced on a governmental level like North does. It's not even close. Um, but if you're talking about vibes, nothing like Atlanta. And my family called uh, VIP. You guys got to look them up. But they embrace me. They show love. Atlanta is lovely. Like, poets, poetry events 
all over the entire state. Like, they are light years ahead. They are connecting. They are building. And it's consistent. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish that the North would have that type of love, that type of camaraderie, and that type of cohesion. It's, it's just nothing like it. And of course, um, as far as the bars go, Baltimore okay. is un, I don't I don't know what they eat in. I don't know <laughs> what they drink in Baltimore. I know I got love for y'all. They're aliens. Like they win like the slam six years in a row. Like, yeah, yeah, the teams Baltimore. are unbelievable. They don't lose. I love it. It's hard body, straight busy. Uh, I love it, man. And so yeah, those are my three stands out. No okay. disrespect to nobody else, but as I teach in my um, clients, I tell them these are the three points right now that are unbelievable. And like you said, there's always things in between depending on what type of poetry you want to be. I'm actually going to be in Atlanta uh, in like two, three weeks for a competition out there. So wish me the best of luck, you know. Oh, saying. you got to. You, um, you're going to have a good time. And remember I'm, to hit those those regular scenes up too. Yeah, that's what I got. I got to be able to stay out there long enough. See, I'm only going out there for like two days. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, come back. Yeah, yeah, I got to come back from yeah. work and all that. So that... That sucks, but I really want to go out there because, like you said, I, uh, I follow someone from Atlanta on the poetry scene. That's how I got connected to okay. out there. And uh, I see every week he's posting, like, you know, uh, you know, come here for this open mic, this open mic, this show, this $500. This, 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 this. I'm like, all right, you know what? Let me go down there and go yeah. see, check it out. So, um, yeah, shout out to them. Um, shout out to the culture and all them. They're out there down in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And then um, my question I was going to ask to you is, like, so... Um, you mentioned your clients, so what, what, what exactly, you know, uh, let's yeah. talk about your clients as hell. Like, <laughs> no, just, exactly just coaching. Yeah. I, I started poetry coaching about two years ago, man, and I'm really excited for the amazing clients that I had over the years. Um, when I first came into the poetry game, people just wasn't giving out the game. Like, you had to find somebody that you knew and ask them a question and hope they weren't hating on you or hope that they were available to give you the knowledge that you need. And I was just like, you know what, man? Like, I, I need to create something myself. Maybe what am I doing? So, you know, as I started doing my thing, more and more poets would ask me and call me. Yo, bro, what you think about this? Where do you think I should go? Do you think I should do a slam? Do you think I should just be an event poet or slam poet or a band poet, all these different things? And I started writing down all the questions when people was asking me. And what I decided was like, let me help these people. I help people anyway. So a lot of people are not my <laughs> coaching client per se, right. but I coach people all day long. They call my phone. I help people. When I got clients in Baltimore, Atlanta. I had a client in all the way on the other side of Pennsylvania. Um, I got a client from New York. Helping people um, walk through the poetry process. We come into the thing. You go to an open mic. You don't know what you're doing. You're just showing up like, yo, uh, you don't know that the best uh, lineup is 7 through 15, right? right? What you do? You go in there, you sign. First time, first, you yeah. first, right? Yeah, I want to be the first one up. No, you get right. there. <laughs> now you first. You don't know how it works. Now you basically, you know, you first or you last. Nobody there. <laughs> you first. Oh, nobody there. tired by the end. By the end, they tired. Right. These things that you don't know. Um Understanding, like you said, introducing yourself to the hosts. I was going to open mic for almost six months. I didn't know the hosts because I just was signing up, not even finding the hosts. So sometimes you need a coach to guide you through a journey that you're about to take when you really don't understand um, where you're about to go on, right? And you go to a poetry venue and it's everything you say is oh, amazing. Then you go to another poetry venue and people think the poem is garbage. You're not getting no love. You're like, well, am I not that good? And you need to understand, you know, where your poetry belongs and where your tribe is. Yeah, that's beautiful. All right. <clears throat> Let me see it's my next question. <laughs> so, like, what was your hardest experiences in the poetry scene? Then? We talked about, you know, being yeah. a foster kid as a poet. Because, you know, we all got, like, you know, these stories. Because poets can be vicious. Believe it or not, I mean, in my own personal, he experience, said it. I could be biased. I so said I'm biased. Biased. These are emotional creatures <laughs> that we're talking about. But I mean, I'm I, sorry. I stand by that message. Uh, no, um, wow. 
foster care poet. So I just, I literally, within the last two years, embraced that title. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Philly. You got black love. You got erotica. You got black pain, black struggle poems. And here is, I am talking about foster care in the middle of West Philly. How do you think that's going to go? Right. There's nobody doing foster care poems. There's, you got, you got me talking about the pain of a foster child. Who cares about that? So for the first couple of years, no one understands what I'm talking about, what I'm doing. Nobody gets it because there is nothing like me and I have to keep going to venues and places where people are looking at me like, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know. He Well, first of all, he's saying he's from Jersey. So I'm in, they believe that I'm in their territory, right. which is location politics. They don't know I'm from there. They have no idea what I am. Right. Here's this Jersey dude, and he's talking about foster care. I mean, okay, why do we care? All right? So the hardest thing was convincing my peers that not that I was good enough, but what I'm saying matters. And that's where it was the hardest thing. But my mom and my team was like, it doesn't matter because you represent literally thousands of people in the city of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. You represent millions of people around the globe. It don't matter if a city doesn't understand. That's one, and this is where I gotta give you all a gem, poets. Your city is literally like this compared to the entire globe. So even if your city doesn't understand what you're talking, it don't matter. The globe, the uh, amount of people who love poetry is in the millions. So you can go to a poetry venue with no, no claps, no love, put the same poem online and the world could respond to it. Like, we love it. Where you at? How can we fly you out? So I knew the hardest thing was convincing to get myself off of that, learning that it doesn't matter what the people believe in this venue. I'm talking to my audience and my tribe. And so these people may not be my tribe, but it doesn't matter. I'm being consistent and I'm understanding as I grow, the open mic is my gem. So I'm sparring with people. I'm sparring with the crowds and trying to get their attention. I'm not being swayed away. And so once you convince yourself that you're talking to your audience and you know where you're going, can't nobody stop you after that. That's beautiful. beautiful. And I say that's beautiful a lot. (laughs) I mean, because it'd be beautiful. You feel me? But um, quick question. So you wrote, uh, you've been able to contribute a lot to poetry. Now we talked about just your writing in general. Now we've talking about the coaching that you do being all over the country that you do. Mm-hmm. Now we're gonna talk about your um, actual books that you have. Now mm-hmm. you had a number of books uh, published and mm-hmm. you actually have one book coming out. I'm gonna let you give the title to the audience. Absolutely. And then we can just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so the first three books was called um, uh, The Story of a Foster Child. So wait, from the tongue of a foster child, I'm sorry. One, two, and three. Mm-hmm. Those books was just basically the way I felt from a foster child's perspective. So I'm giving my view on everything from, you know, girls. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about everything in those books. They just, me going in and I'm doing a three-part series. I close it out with the third one. Mm -hmm. The fourth one, though, was more, the people was like, yo, we need something that's more streamlined. So that was called, you know, a foster child's interview. So basically, it's really, the book was created because I felt like at the time when I thought of it, I wasn't getting no press. So that ain't the problem no more now, but at the time. So you interviewed yourself. Yeah, interviewed yourself <laughs> at that time. Somebody got to do it. God is amazing. But yeah, so at first I'm like, yo, he's like giving no interviews. They not feeling me. Now look at you. So I'm like, yo, all right, cool. I'm going to make my own book called The Foster Child's Interview. And then in the book, I have questions, and then I answer with a poem. Mm. So there's somebody interviewing me, and they're like, yo, okay, how did you feel about being a foster child in high school? Then I do a poem responding that. How did you feel about people talking about you when you were a kid? 
Then I do a poem and I'll respond to that. That's beautiful. And I and I know that these are books, but they also can be found on YouTube too. Correct. Yeah, because I was able to listen to Foster Kid one, two, and three right. years ago. Um, so now that we move forward to the new book that you have out as well, what's the title of that? The, the yeah. title of that is Dating with Foster Care My Bags. Okay, now let's talk about Dating with Foster Care. Now Foster this Foster. is my my lovely ladies <laughs> have been supporting me since day one. Like they buy 90% of my stuff. They are amazing. The black women that are supporting me are phenomenal. They were wondering and they wanted it from the previous book that's something called the Shift Series. The Shift Series is me in real accounts of uh, like kissing and doing certain things with intimacy. Oh, okay, okay. So oh, like it was. Yeah, Shift uh, Series. Okay. okay. So when you read that, the third one, the woman was like, yo, we want more of this type of... I, I would all say, that's that video you dropped last week. Is that the... Uh, <laughs> you got a video, we're going to call it the eggplant video or something like that. I don't know what that is. It, 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 yeah, it's it's so, a, uh, yeah, I can't. Yeah, it's um, Matiz. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's Matiz. Yeah, we'll Matiz. If we ain't going to get... And Matiz is from this, this book, right? Okay. So what happened was, the woman was like, babe. We love you, we support you, but we, we need to know what it was like to be a foster child in dating. Give us, we want to know what's going on in dating world, and, and we love the poems where you're motivating us in dating and, and you know, loving us for who we are. Can we get more of that? Cool. So I went in the lab and I was like, yo, I never told people what it was like to date as a foster child because the foster care is in my bags, which means trauma is in my bags abandonment is in my bags right mm -hmm. so i gotta give the stories of what i was thinking what it was like to date from a foster child perspective so that's what this book is doing and so matized and <laughs> all these different um poems uh, my ex these are poems of really true accounts of what it's like to be me um dating through this mindset that I have to fight every day and hopefully I find a woman that I need to marry and to build with but I have a, this bag full of foster care. Oh, you know, man, you got, a, you got a book. He got he published a book off his dating experiences. Yes. Yeah, that's and, I, and that's oh, okay, it. I think it's that book. That's book. Oh, it's going to be, bro, it's a lot of poems that I cut it down. So when they come out, I cut it down. I'm going to cut it down to about 20 to 25. That's good. Because the first, right, the, the first one is too much. Yeah. It's so much that I want to say in it. So, yeah. So that's the next book that's coming out. And a lot of people are loving the, the poems for yeah, you yeah, laughing. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. That was funny. Mm -hmm. So like, um, as far as your um your your book, when is when can we expect it to be out? Ever? I'm hoping by September. Okay. I don't wanna rush it, but I, I definitely do want it out by September because um there's a lot that comes with the book. Um I wanna do a talk. You know, session around it. The rollout is going to be a little bit different than usual because dating with trauma and foster care is so vast, mm -hmm. and I don't want people to miss this by just putting out a book and then, all right, you buy it or you don't. Like, nah, it's a lot that goes with it that I'm explaining in the book as well. I definitely think it touches on a a, a, a part, a, a pillar of like you know just the black community mm -hmm. and just mental health in general because you know. Being in foster care definitely affects your mental health. Mm -hmm. It definitely uh, would affect your trust mm -hmm. and things like that. And then going into the field and trying to find a relationship and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I can just imagine how that experience could carry over oh, into, those, into those relationships. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, you might feel, I don't want to say, uh, I don't want to say toxic. I want to say like, you might feel, right, but yeah. you know what I'm saying? You right. might feel like, like, <sighs> like, the I got damaged. Yeah. I'm the, the, I hate to say it, but like, yeah, I'm like damaged I'm goods. Like, you, you yeah, it. like yeah. damaged goods, but yeah. I'm a good person, but I'm damaged. Yeah. And every day I talk to people about foster care. Every day we have to fight those, the, the, the mental scarring where I talk about in, the, in other interviews that I do have to fight against abandonment voice. Like, yo, I'm dating this girl, but do I think she's going to stay? How I know she won't leave, like X. 
How I know she won't, you know, how I know that she really is this thing. How do I know this person really loved me? When they say it, do I really believe that? I was telling somebody in another interview about when you talk about love, what does that mean to the person? Because as it relates to me, people said it, but I don't believe them because of all I've been through, mm -hmm. right? And so how do you date somebody now? You're a grown man and this woman is amazing, but you got some issues that you got to keep fighting and she don't know that yet. And as a man, when do we write that with vulnerability, right? And say that out loud. That's why I knew I had to create this book because I was like, most men, they're not going to go here mm -hmm. because now I got to tell the true weakness of who ambition is when it comes to dating as I reveal this foster child, right? Now I talked about all that anger and pain. Now I got to talk about, I got some damage areas of my life as it relates to the dating side too. So, yeah. Okay. So like, as far as, um, I'm sorry, because I, I, I ain't gonna hold you. I, I'm starting to think of questions now. <laughs> this is getting really good. Right. Um, I want to know like, um, how has the poetry scene changed from the time you started till now? Yeah, I definitely got that question. Well, that's good. I got that. I'm gonna say, when I first came, I felt like you had to put the work in on the ground. You Like you had to go to open mics. You couldn't just keep posting online and get hot. Like that just was not how it was. I mean, you mm -hmm. had to go to some hot open mics and put in the work. Now, like you said, I mean, you, you post online, you, you can do your thing online. You catch a viral video and-, and It's you, over. Yeah, you can yeah it's not as, yeah. And when I first came out, I felt like it was a little bit more pressure on the bars. Like, it, like I felt like, like you had to be a little bit better. I feel now, you know what I mean? Your vibe, people like you, you can be less on the bars, but as long as people like you and they follow you, right, don't matter. Right. You so, know what I mean? They can win events, poets, comp competitions, everything. People love you. Right. You don't work on your sure. charisma and you work on your your person game. You don't have to be good and can get everywhere. And then the person who's really good but scared to go to that open mic, who's scared to reach out to people, who's scared to really say stuff can be stuck. So, you know, it's a little bit different, yeah. So you definitely think that the, the difference is the mobility aspect of yeah. the, how you can be able to kind of transverse the, the poetry scene and all Correct. that jazz. Don't, because it's so much more involved now. It's aesthetics, the way you look, the way you present yourself, yeah, it's, the way yeah. you come. Mm -hmm. Like, like I tell people, we go into poetry events now. I got a security person, I got an admin, I got a video man, photographer. I'm coming in there with six people Cause it's the way it's a movement, you know. People think like being an artist is just like songwriting. It's not. It's presentation mm -hmm. from the time you walk in the venue all the way to you leave. Before you even talk, you being an artist, like you said. And then you gotta do your interviews. Mm -hmm. You can't just do bars, bars. People wanna see you <laughs> sit down. But they wanna know what you eat, in, what you like, what you like, who you are. You know what I mean? It's a lot more. Yeah, most definitely. And I think that like another part that I would say as far as like, I mean, I, I would consider myself, I don't think I've been in a poetry game that long. I would say like since 2016. So that's like whatever. But I think just in that small amount of time, I've been able to see changes mm -hmm. and different things like that. And just how social media has been able to impact it. Because mm -hmm. like you said, it's all about, to me, my experience, I can be a little jaded. Um, but <laughs> Charles is a savage. Yo, he's a savage. I'm just saying, I could be a little dirty, but I, I do think that like a large part of it is now um how you how you look and not physically always, but more so like how you said about the aesthetic and with um I'm starting to see like it's more so like I have to have a platform that I'm writing on. You get what I'm saying mm -hmm. to be able to like push something, and it's like I don't know, like it don't always be a uh, true to their experience. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, yours is true to the experience. That's what you yeah. lived. A lot of them is like, I've been seeing this whole, you know, peace, love, beanie stuff. And then, right. you know, you get behind closed doors and you got horns on her head. That's and stuff true. Like that. So, because, yeah. So, it, 
it's, a, it's too thick. What's happening? I'm glad he brought this up, guys, because he's talking about their business poets. Right. And there's authentic business poets. So, yeah, like, I live through my poetry, mm-hmm. and some people, they live their business to poetry. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, so, whatever, you know. Yeah. Oh, we need to do this at our poetry event. <laughs> oh, we're doing erotica today. So, because you know they're going to get in the door. Oh, I, I see people did erotica event. I look down, they know the slam. All right, tell them down. Now, they doing the true teeth. Whoa. So, it depends. Some people are, like you said, they're trying to make the money. And they're trying to do things through business perspective. And then some people, like you said, are authentic. Mm-hmm. Um, and behind doors, <laughs> behind closed doors, the same. And <laughs> right. some, like you said, they're doing the love job. Right. Behind the door, yo, where are the jaws at? Whoa. You just, <laughs> All right. You just <laughs> said you was a love boy. <laughs> Now you tell me where the girls is at. You know what I mean? What? Yeah. I don't get it. So, you know, it. that's the thing about this poetry journey is understanding where your tribe is mm-hmm. and, and being authentic to yourself with, you know, good people around you right. that you could trust. Because it's definitely, it's definitely a place for everybody right. um, in poetry. It's definitely a place for everybody. If you can write, if you can put a sentence together, if you can do whatever, you, mm-hmm. even if you can't, poetry exists in so many different ways. Right. So, uh, it's always a space for poetry for everyone. I didn't want to, you know, discourage anyone, but y'all know y'all be too faced sometimes. <laughs> I ain't gonna do that. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm sorry. I had to get it off my chest. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it's authentic. I had to get it off my chest. It's real, though. It's, it's, I'm sorry. It's, it's, he's it's, telling the truth. It's a little part of life. Um, but I think that, you know, I'm glad that you've been able to come here and share your story. And I just wanted to leave off, like, what is something that you would like to tell foster kids who may be watching this and children who may just feel displaced in general, mm-hmm. um, what would you tell them, man? What would you, uh, what words of encouragement would you give them in regards to writing and how they can find their strength in that path? Right, I definitely will talk to them the two, two different sides, yeah. The foster child first is, number one, it's not our fault. And this is really hard to dig into. We don't have enough time here, but a lot of times we internalize what happened to us as if it was us that did it to oneself. And it's usually our, the generation before us, our parents, who have made decisions that have put us in bad situations. And sometimes we believe that it's our fault or something that we did or our mere existence is the reason why we're in this bad situation. But that's not true. And so I would tell the foster child today is to understand that it's not your fault. Number two is... Your environment and what you see in the bad times doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be tomorrow. I love the uh, Mayno got this, the first album, because if, if tomorrow comes, and tomorrow come, I, I based off of the sun is always going to come up tomorrow. This notion that because it's dark today, that it'll be dark tomorrow is just not true. But people will sell you that. And then foster care, one of the things I want to tell the foster kid to get around from it's people selling them the sad story every day. You're a foster child, so you can't make it. The foster child, the statistics say you're going to be incarcerated. You're going to be homeless. You're going to be... I don't know why people continuously sell a story to you while you're already living it. So number one, you got to get amazing people around you. Number two, you got to believe in oneself. And you got to listen to your voice over other people's voices because you don't know where those voices are are coming from in their head and what they want for their life may not be what you want for yours. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, understanding what's deep down inside of you is way bigger than what's in the environment. That's why I believe in God made sure that he said, I'm going to put jewels and gifts inside of you because I know that people are going to try to say, because you live here or because you live in the burbs or because you live in the hood, you can't do it. But I created you and I created your environment. And you're there for a particular reason to shine. So that's why I'm going to tell the foster kids. Now, as far as... <laughs> that was, he started as as, spitting poetry. I started ahead. getting... Yeah, yeah I, I felt that. I'm going to sit here like, all right, let me just shut the... I mean, let me <laughs> watch you. As far as the poet is concerned, well, 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 well. What they going to say? 
You want to go to an open mic? That's what's going to happen. First get in there, my name is Ambition the Poet. No one cares. They looking like this. First of all, they don't know you. They don't care about your message. I don't care about what people are looking, if they're snapping or if they clapping. Who cares? They don't know you anyway. They don't know how you got there in the first place. And as a matter of fact, who said that they are the gatekeepers? So continue to do your poetry. Continue to write. We're not worried about the person that runs the open mic. We don't even care if the host likes us. The open <laughs> mic. <laughs> the open mic is for the people who are trying to make their brand better. If the host got a problem or if they got an attitude, then they need to get out your city and stop hosting. Hosting is breeding the upcoming talent and making them better. You made the platform for the people. So the poet needs to understand, I'm not here for the host. I'm here for my audience. I'm here to make myself and my voice available because God, the way I believe it, made something inside of you. I can't reach the person you could talk to. Only you can reach that person. No matter how hard I try to talk to somebody from Camden, Charles may be the only way they can hear that message. I can't reach him. You can, right? right? And as an example. And so that's what I would tell the poet. Be consistent. I don't care how, how much people don't care. I don't care if you get two views or three views. Go in my YouTube right now. I got videos on there that have no views. <laughs> but I kept posting. I kept shining. And I kept going. And then I say this last thing. Poetry, you have to get out the open mic, poet. If you think you're going to get to the top by hustling at every open mic, it ain't going to happen. You talking to me. You got to go to your, <laughs> you gotta go to your networking events. You got to go to your, polit your politician events. You got to get politics. You got to understand who's the power in your area. You have to also go to um, networking events. Politic events, uh, galas, you have to understand that your territory has to expand outside of the open mic. The open mic is just one uh, pillar to your growth as a poet. If you do that, you'll be fine. So, I mean, that's all I have. That's right? a beautiful thing. Give another bars, man. <laughs> now it's time to start the verses, man, <laughs> between me and the ambition. Starting right now, it's like, nah, just <laughs> Nah, it's all love. Thank you guys for checking. Thank you guys for checking in. Your boy Charles Curtis III was back with another one with your boy Ambition, my yes, brother sir. in poetry, the hardest working man in poetry. The P. Diddy of poetry, <laughs> but he writes, his own, he writes his own stuff though. <laughs> this man is all over the place. Please check him out. Please support him. Please. Uh, pre-order his new book. Let us know where we can find you, where we Definitely. can pre-order your new book that's out before we wrap up. Definitely. Find me on um, AmbitionThePoet.com. Uh, You're going to be able to find me AmbitionThePoet on Instagram, Facebook, AmbitionThePoet, the artist. Listen, if you Google AmbitionThePoet, you going to find me. Listen, and I'm not one of those standoff poets. Inbox me if you have any questions. I make sure. I always tell people I don't want to see no more poets getting extorted. <laughs> so, <laughs> a lot of y'all getting, they telling you it costs a hundred dollars to perform and then you only getting 20 bucks on the back end. Nah, listen, <laughs> hit me up at hey, Ambition the Poet. I help you all ask me questions. I love you guys. I want to see you win. And I really mean it. I ain't just saying it because in the camera. You can hit me offline and I will be here uh, as a steward to help you uh, find your way in this poetry world. So, yeah. That's it. Politics and Poetry, the written experience is out. Uh, fuck, day in, uh, what is it? Day in with <laughs> foster care in your bags. Day in soon. with foster kids, with foster care in my bag. Day in with foster care <laughs> in my bags. You can pre-order right now on ambition.com. Yes. We gonna get it right. See y'all. <laughs>